It's a smooth operator, one of the most balanced and easy to ride motorcycles I've ever ridden. Acceleration is linear across the torque range, it's easy to modulate the brakes to get gradual stopping power, turning speeds are just about right, you wouldn't tell it has a 21 inch front wheel, but then it holds its line very well. The riding position is a bit more akin of a sports touring than an adventure motorcycle, but it does make it easier to go faster on pavement. The motorcycle is comfortable on the highway and on dirt. All of this framed by a great soundtrack coming from its three inline cylinder motor. And I like the looks of it too, especially this first series with the black frame and the orange color. This is my 2012 Triumph Tiger 800XC, which I bought new in July of 2011. When BMW launched the F800GS in 2008, it brought with it the rebirth, the popularization of the large multi-cylinder Enduro machines the place that had been left vacant when the street versions of the Dakar motorcycles were discontinued, like the Honda NXR 750 Africa Twin and the Yamaha XTZ 750 Super Tenere, among others. The F800GS marked the transition from Dakar race replicas to adventure motorcycles. Although we should not forget the KTM 950, which launched in 2004, and which is a beast on its own, it was really the BMW 800GS in 2008 and then the Tiger 800XC in 2011 that consolidated what became the mid-size adventure motorcycle market. These bikes started a new trend. They were the first approachable mid-size motorcycles that could claim the adventure motorcycle classification on that size. These two bikes proved to have good off-road and on-road capability, they were great adventure motorcycles, they were an entry point into adventure riding for people like me, moving from a single cylinder bike like my 650GS Dakar. But that was then, today, more than a decade later, we are on a new world. From then to now, all adventure motorcycles have grown in size and weight and acquired new technology. The F800GS and the Tiger 800XC themselves have become 850, then 900 machines and acquired a few pounds in this process. The KTM went from 950 to 990, 1190 and 1290. The Super Tenere returned as a 1200. The Africa Twin returned but in liter size and soon after it acquired an additional 100 cc's. As these bikes grew in size, like a musical chairs game, they again vacated a space on the range of the adventure motorcycles. This vacant space allowed the mid-size market to be redefined or further segmented into more options. And this time, the crop of new mid-size, the new adventure motorcycles between 660 and 800 cc's, all with compact parallel twin motors with 270 degrees crank pins, got much closer to the infamous unicorn. This was a much requested and anticipated refresh of motorcycles by the ADV community. And it all happened in the last few years, led by the Yamaha Tenere 700 and the KTM 790 in 2019. The 790 in particular, and here I have my 2019 as an example, came with all the accoutrements that until then were only available on the bigger bikes, like cornering ABS, riding modes, and top shelf suspension components. And now we find them in more affordable, practical, and approachable packages. The T7 is an exception here. It's a bare bones version of old school, if you will, except for its motor, of course. The T7 and the 790 were closely followed by the introduction of two other motorcycles 
under 500 pounds, the Aprilia Touareg 660, a nice surprise, and the Honda Transalp 750. And then there is the Suzuki Vistrom 800DE, disconcertingly heavier than the other new bikes of similar displacement. So I look at these new bikes and then I look back at my 12-year-old Tiger 800 XC. Together with the original F800GS, could these more than a decade old bikes possibly, today, go head to head with these new bikes in terms of on-road and off-road performance? Aside from the fancy electronics most of these new bikes have, when bench comparing them with the 800GS and the 800XC, their specs are on similar ground. At the end of this video, I'll bring this chart back and I'll conclude my thoughts about this comparison of old versus new. But to get there though, let's first talk about my 2012 Tiger 800XC. Since its launch in 2008 and a couple of years after, I lusted over the F800GS. I test rode it twice, I loved it. But when I heard rumors that Triumph would have its own version of an Enduro or Adventure machine, I decided to wait and see. Speculations were going crazy in the forums and I came across a promo video of a Tiger jumping out of a box truck or something similar. <laughs> I captured that photo of it, and I remember the three-cylinder motor screaming in that video. Eventually, in 2011, they came around. I took the street version of the Tiger 800 and also a Triumph Tiger Sport for a test ride, and I was sold. I got on the waiting list for an 800 XC. And the day I got it, July 7th, 2011, I filled up the tank and started riding it and I could not stop riding it until I had covered more than 200 miles with it. I took it on single lane roads all the way to the coast. I couldn't tire of it. It was my first multi-cylinder machine. I was in awe. This was the beginning of a long friendship. Louis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. This bike made me grow as a motorcycle rider. I learned a lot with it in the few thousand miles we rode together. I learned about the adventure riding thing. I started riding it everywhere in the state and in neighboring states. Very quickly I organized a luggage system for it, a combination of a Pelican hard case with a quick disconnect and a giant loop great basin, which were easy to install and take out of the bike and a few weeks later, soon after its first service, I took it on a trip down Highway 101. It was a great opportunity to get to know the motorcycle while going to some of the most beautiful locations and greatest roads in the world along the way. The Tiger turned to be a great road bike. I can ride about 200 miles with a fuel tank. The motor operates at a good range on two-lane highways it has good legs for long distance travel. I stopped at several places along the way. I tried to always stay as close as possible to the coast, but I indulged on several side trips here and there. There's so much to see along this highway. I went all the way to San Francisco, crossed the Golden Gate Bridge, found the first turnaround and crossed the Golden Gate Bridge back and started right there, my journey back home. I travel frequently on segments of Highway 101 on my travels in Oregon or when going to California or the state of Washington. But I really enjoyed this trip with the Tiger. It was the first time I rode all the way to San Francisco and back. On the way back, I took a detour to ride on the Lost Coast, which was a special chapter on this ride. It was quite windy, but I still was able to enjoy this one lane road leading to the coast at some points and traveling along the coast at other times. One other interesting event that happened on this trip was when crossing back from California to Oregon, I noticed a crowd of people on the Klamath River Bridge and new screws were there as well, so I had to stop and check it out. It turns out a whale had swum up the river in search of her calf, so she stayed there swimming in circles trying to find her calf. 
Several days later, she passed away. It talks about the power of the connection between a mother whale and her cat. But I digress. But since we are talking about a bond, this trip was a great way for me to bond with this machine, a trip I'll never forget. And thank you for indulging me on showing some of that footage here, which is obviously more for me than for you who clicked here to learn about the motorcycle and not to get a trip report of more than 10 years ago. After this trip, the Tiger and I went on several other trips. I did take it off pavement several times, but nothing really serious. And then two years later, I prepared it for more serious off pavement riding. Using Triumph's own accessory line, I installed a bash plate and engine protection bars. From Tour Attack, I got the headlight protection and a wider footprint for the side stand. I created my own rear shock protection from a piece of car mat. I extended the front fender. I installed a handlebar riser, very important for this bike. I installed a 12 charger connector for the Pelican box. I installed a unifilter socket for the air snorkel. I also installed tires that were just good enough for desert roads. Later, I also installed an aftermarket slip-on exhaust just to make it sound even better. I took it on my usual routes in Southeast Oregon. Here we are on my favorite dirt roads where I have to say the Tiger performed rather well. It delivers a very solid fuel it travels well on gravel and on dirt and sandy tracks. It showed to be an excellent off-pavement machine in terms of performance and handling. So, what did I learn about this bike in these last 12 years? Well, it definitely falls in the adventure category. And although it does very well on dirt, I think of it more as a road bike, a street bike, a sports touring machine, even a canyon riding machine. Overall, it's a very impressive machine, but in my opinion, with a road bias. And I'll explain. To explain why I see a road bias on this machine, I'll have to look into some of the negatives of this bike, especially three of them. The first one, and the most important one, in my opinion, is its one-piece frame. Although it makes for a rigid frame, not having a bolted subframe carries a problem when you think you will be dropping and crashing this bike off-road. And to make matters worse, it is one piece with the passenger foot pegs as well, and they do stick out as foot pegs should. So I always imagined crashing it and bending the frame and totaling the motorcycle. Triumph has since addressed this issue. Now the passenger foot pegs can be removed, but most importantly, the rear portion of the frame is now a bolted subframe. I knew about this when I purchased the motorcycle, but the other option, the F800GS, had its own frame issues as well, and it was also a potential frame bending issue. The second issue is related to dust. It is an annoyance and not as much as a deal breaker. Adventure motorcycles should handle dust well, right? Well, the 2012 Tiger has an issue with that. I'm not sure whether Triumph has addressed this and when on later models, but I know that in my bike, dust gets into the stepper motor actuation at the throttle bodies. Eventually, it causes you to lose idle speed. To me, it happened when I was on a solo ride near Fields, Oregon. I had crossed Domingo Pass and I was going towards Nevada and then I started going north again, and just before I descended to Hawks Valley, I noticed the bike had lost idle speed. I feared the problem could get worse, 
but as long as it started and stayed on while on movement, all was good. The bottom line is that the bike made it home. Once I got home, I looked up on the internets and learned a few others had already reported the same issue and there were a few people already showing a fix with a diagram showing how cleaning the engagement roller of the stepper motor solved the problem. I took care of it right away, not a big deal. It was basically just a thin film of dust that what caused the problem. The fix was simple, but do you want to have to do this frequently? Removing the tank, removing the airbox and getting into that actuator? Now, 12 years later, I can only assume Triumph has addressed this issue already. The third thing is the three-cylinder motor, with the cylinders firing evenly with its 120-degree crank pins. It's very smooth. And what was a love story at first, with that linear acceleration, the sounds under acceleration, all of a sudden, it became boring. Riding my Street Fighter and later my Multistrada and now all other two-cylinder motorcycles I've ridden since then sold me on two cylinders, especially V's and 270 degrees parallel twins. I like how these two-cylinder motors deliver the power, not sure I can describe it. It's more how you perceive the bike moves, how revs and sounds match the twist of the throttle. Torque delivery is where it's at. After riding my KTM 790 that has the same horsepower as my Triumph and the KTM reaches maximum power at lower RPM, that is, it has sensibly more torque and it also happens at lower RPMs. You feel the depth of the acceleration. It's difficult to explain, but it's easy to experience. I know, it's a preference issue. But apparently, I was not the only one talking about it, because in 2020, Triumph addressed this issue by changing this motorcycle's crankshaft. The new motor was bumped to 900 cc's, but puts out the same 94 horsepower as the previous 800 cc Tiger. What changed is how it makes its power and torque, and where it sits in the rev range, and, more importantly, how it's delivered. So this new crankshaft has two cylinders working at a 180 degrees of each other and a third cylinder at 90 degrees from them. In a 1, 3, 2 firing order it creates just enough imbalance for fun and more torque. As a matter of fact it still matches the KTM 790 in horsepower but now it gets closer to it also in the torque figures and at lower RPMs, just that it needs more cc's to deliver it. The 790, in my opinion, still has the edge as it gets the power and torque at lower RPMs. And it's also lighter. And the final problem is wind protection, which is not a big deal. I tried removing the windshield to get rid of the buffeting. It helped, but not quite enough. If I would ride it more, I would look at larger windshields or some other solution. So, after what I described about my 2012 Tiger 800 XC, let's go back to that table. Does it give now a better idea of how it compares with the new motorcycles? Like I mentioned in the beginning of the video, the Tiger competes with all of them in terms of specs. It's heavier than all of them, with the exception of the Suzuki 800DE. In terms of power and torque, it's there with all of them, except that it needs more RPMs to deliver it, thanks to the motor configuration as we just discussed. There is no question that 270 degree parallel twins are modern, fun and lively motors. The inline 3 and the 360 parallel twins they are older motors, but they still deliver fun responses to throttle input. They could be valued by their uniqueness and quirky characters. If I wanted an adventure motorcycle to mostly ride on paved roads and here and there get on dirt roads, 
the Tiger would go head to head with Transalp 750 and the Vistrom 800DE. It would be a good bargain to get one today and travel the world. However, if I wanted a more dirt oriented bike, I would not get the Tiger not for its performance but for its frame and dust issue. The bargain would certainly be the F800GS and I'll get some of those shock bolt fixes that have become available. It goes head to head with the Tenere, KTM 790 and the Touareg. But overall, these decade old machines cannot compete with the electronics these new bikes have. My Tiger does not even have a way to control the simple dash functions from the handlebars. You need to use the two buttons in the dash itself. However, Aside from the dust issue, the Tiger has been a very reliable machine. I never had any problems with it. It is oil and filter changes, ride and repeat. And it still rides and looks like new. And I do think it still looks great. Much better than some of these new bikes. Especially in my opinion, it looks better than the 790, the Transalp and, eight, and the 800DE. And in my opinion, it also looks better than the new versions of itself. In the end, it's all subjective. It's a very capable machine and it still delivers great performance 12 years later. Thank you for watching.